Hi, welcome everybody. This is Tiffany Bova. I'm here today on LinkedIn Live for my What's Next podcast with my dear friend, Melissa DiDonato. She is the CEO of SUSE. So welcome, Melissa, to the show today. Thank you so much. I'm super happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, you know, in full transparency, we're really good friends. Uh, she was a client of mine many years ago. We worked together at Salesforce. I wrote parts of my book on her kitchen counter in London. So we go way back. But, you know, she has had an amazing career and one in which I just thought was a great story during this time, you know, as a CEO during a pandemic, taking a company public. What a crazy time. So let's start at the beginning, Melissa. You know, why don't you give our listeners a little bit of background on what got you to the CEO role? Because I think it's an amazing journey. Amazing, I'm not sure. A long one, it feels like these days. And it's more like dog years, isn't it? Um, you know, I I, um, I didn't start out my career ever thinking I'd be a CEO or, or even with the ambition of becoming a CEO. I just wanted to get into tech. Um, I started my career in 1996 as an SAP R3 developer. Very few women, maybe one of two in my cohort. Um, you know, being an, an R3 engineer was not a destination job 25 years ago. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe it has become since then. But I always was interested in transformation in technology and what technology could do to transform businesses. So the journey has always been in tech. I've never done anything else besides tech roles. Having I kind of break my career up into three major buckets. The, the first third, if you will, was engineering and and focused on um, on the technology itself. The middle part was on services and sales, and the last part was in general management. And obviously, that's what I've been doing now. I've been I was appointed the CEO of SUSE just under two years ago. Um, I worked a couple of months in the background, so I, I just passed my two year anniversary. Um, and then from the announcement of actually um, leading the company, as you as you know, recently, uh, 20 months later, we listed on the on the DAX Frankfurt Prime Stock Exchange on the 19th of May, which was super exciting. So in the evolution of the career, I, I was, it, was, it was definitely a journey from being a technologist and an engineer to then moving from engineering into pre-sales, which is obviously the, the technical side of sales, and then eventually into sales. Uh, everyone kept saying, you know, it's really hard to find sales leaders who understand the depths of the technology. And that, and that I knew well, so I, I kind of fit the role. And you know, once I started getting my commission checks, I thought, oh, this 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 could suit me just fine. Yeah, this is great. I like sales. So off I went, and then eventually, obviously, you move up from sales into general management, and spent almost three years at sales at um, SAP, where I was the chief revenue officer and then the chief operating officer of the digital core. Before that, with you, obviously, at Salesforce, nearly seven years. Um, so it's been um, a, a long history in tech. I've never done anything else, but as a first time CEO, um, you know, during a pandemic uh, was a whole different experience. I mean. Perhaps I, you know, you couldn't plan for that's for sure. Everyone said, oh, this is a great opportunity. They said, you're going to be a killer CEO, they said. <laughs> and then a year into the journey, um, the pandemic hit, not even a year, right? So um, I wasn't quite prepared, but um, I look back now and think that um, the world's changed, but I've also changed as a person, as, as a friend, as a mom, as a leader, um, and definitely um, the CEO I came in and the CEO I am now are definitely different. Uh, I, I would I would agree with that statement, but I, you know I, I want to unpack a little bit of what you said because I think um, so much of the work you do on the side of your day job is really trying to inspire the next generation of women and girls in STEM. And your career started in STEM, which is unusual, right? As you said, like I aspire to be an engineer, and then you stumbled into sales. Uh, I was the complete opposite. I wasn't as smart as you. Sales was the way I had to go. <laughs> But, you know, what do you think is the way in which we can get more women and girls into STEM early? Because I think it has, in your case, like opened so many doors for you to, to, you know, find this career path that you're on. Gosh, you know, I was so lucky, right? I mean, I was so lucky because I got into tech purely on the recommendation of my mentor. I was getting my MBA at American University in Washington, D.C., and the dean of the business school, I walked in. Women girls into STEM early because they Sorry, go ahead. I, I, I walked into the business school and said, um, you know, I, I want to go to business school. I, I moved to Washington, D.C. in the first instance because I wanted to be the first female ambassador to Russia. So I thought, <laughs> I'm going to go off and I'm going to get. Wait, hold, wait, time out. Stop. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> so back that up. 
Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again a little slower. Yeah. So before engineering, before technology, <laughs> I wanted to be the first female ambassador to Russia. I was getting my my master's degree in Russian um, and I thought I wanted to go into public service and I wanted to lead our country in relations with you know, the former Soviet Union having grown up in the generation of Rocky. Right. So I thought, oh, this is it's a great thing. I'm going to go to D.C. I got to D.C. from New York and realized, oh, gosh, you know, this is going to be a lot harder than I thought. And, and maybe it's maybe public service is not for me. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to do. So I walked into the business school. Um, and a professor called uh, August Schomburg was his name at American University. And I said, I'd like you to be my mentor. I need some advice. I, I don't know what to do with, you know, where I am today. And I'm getting my, my master's degree in Russian, but I think I need to apply it to something else besides public service. And that's when he said his exact words, Tiffany, were you ought to get into this SAP thing. I think it's catching on. That moment was the, it was the defining moment of my life, right? And that's where I change from public service and technology. Now, I was lucky, as you say, I was very, very lucky that I had the advice of that mentor. But a lot of these young girls don't even a get exposed to the right role models. They don't know what technology means. And, and for them, uh, you know, I have a seven year old girl and for her, technology is very different because of, of, of who her mother is. Right. And she knows what technology is. In fact, her best girlfriend came over the other day and said, I've told my mommy that I think that she should be leading an IPO. I mean, these kids are seven, right? You know, I said, okay, make sure you, she's a stay at home mom, but okay, let, let's see if we can, I mean, I can encourage her, you know, to do an IPO, um, but, but they need role models. They don't have the ability naturally inherent to, to young girls to say, oh, tech is my, is my gig. It's my space. It could be someplace for me to go. Traditionally, it's been dominated, obviously, as we know today, by boys and eventually by men. And in fact, when I was in uni and university and college in, in the US, all of the IT graduates were all men. I mean, I was one of two women that took up engineering. So, you know, having a young girl and seeing the, the role that I needed to begin to play to help encourage more girls, not just into STEM subjects and not just into, you know, into technology as a whole, but I realized a fundamental gap and the gap is the confidence, right? They they need to avoid stereotypes of what is a male role and a female role, and you know, and, and they need to start building confidence at a very young age. Um, about eight months ago, uh, I started a charity called Inner Wings here in the UK that's now being brought in and, and being developed inside of the US and also inside Next in Germany, where it's all about confidence building. It's all about focusing on young girls age six to twelve, building their confidence in STEM and technology, in maths and sciences, but but also in themselves. Right. To take the inner wings inside and to put it on the outside. I've written three children's books. You can see one here behind me, the magic box, all about empowering young girls to look and seek for different types of role models. You really can't for, you know, for a girl, you can't be what you can't see. And unfortunately, there's not enough role models in the world. In fact, um, our chief product and marketing officer called me today and he told me a story about his young girl who's 12. And during lockdown was having even more problems than she you know, otherwise might have had. She's a very confident girl. She played the piano, did a lot of sports. And now since lockdown, she's lost all of that. She's lost the ability to build confidence and to get validated in an open space like you do in school or with your friends or on the sports you know, pitch or on the field. And, and I've done some talks that she's watched and she's followed. And, you know, Thankfully, I, I feel grateful that I've been able to be a role model for this young girl. So I I can do that. And you know what? Tech is not about you know a hood or or jeans, but maybe it is. Or tech you know is not about you know big hair and high heels like me. It really is about being whatever you want. As long as we can begin to educate the girls on this, right? And you know help them realize they could be whatever they want. And tech is a great home to start then we'll be solving tomorrow's problems today. Well, I think there's so much that you said and I and I couldn't agree more. You know, you and I share the fact that at young ages we played sports. And I think that's a great way to build confidence, you know, and so as you just said, you know, she doesn't have the ability to do that. Um but, you know, I, I think that confidence is something that you you always have to work on. You know, I call it the it's confidence muscle. muscle. Yeah, yeah. Right. You got to work it out. You got to keep working it out. And it's like going to the gym. Sometimes you're much more sore, you know, than other times. And, and the second you start to feel comfortable, you know, you got to start stretching yourself again. So, um, you know, you were at a decision point in in determining whether you wanted to be a CEO 
and take the role or to do something else? And when you were at that crossroad, uh, what, what sort of led you to say, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot? So that's a really important, I think, and good question. I mean, you were part of that decision um, with me uh, when when I was making the decision, do I take job A um, or do I take job B? And job A I had actually accepted, which is not the one I'm in. Um, I had accepted that role and I thought it was much more appropriate for me and kind of the growth of my career and where I was headed and the skills I had. Um, the CEO role was a great opportunity for me. And, and you, you know, you were part of this decision, right? I, I was, we were spitballing, as they say, like, and, and, you know, you didn't hear a lot of, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a CEO. I know I can do it. It was, I want to do it, but can I do it? And what's the impact of this decision? And what's it going to mean to my family? What's it going to mean to me? You know, do I have the skills to be able to do it? And th this is a big, big role. When EQT called me on a Sunday evening and said, hey, how about this Sousa thing? I said, yeah, how about it? I can remember <laughs> so clearly, you know, how about it? It was in, it was in March um, of 2019. And you know, I had known Sousa very well. I, I, I had developed the first Linux operating systems for SAP, for R3 to move from Unix to Linux 23 years ago. Being at SAP, running the digital core, I also knew very well about Sousa, a big part of Hack, about, you know, now part of Rise, you know, a big part of the transition to the cloud, but also on-prem. And, and, and my view was quite narrowed in a way. I, I, I thought, oh, wow, Sousa is a good fit for me and, and I'm a good fit for it probably because of my SAP experience. And then I began to explore a bit more about what SUSE is and what it wanted to become. And I began to realize that SUSE power is a big part of the global economy. Uh, you know, we're in, inside of things like life-saving medical devices like mammograms, right? I mean, even mammogram is probably run by SUSE technology. We're inside of satellites, cruise ships. We're gonna be inside of BMWs this year powering autonomous vehicles all the way through to core banking systems and SAP, of course, and, and the like. So this business had been built on the premise of mission critical workloads. And I and, and the more research I had done before joining, the more afraid I got, the more I realized, oh no, like, wow, I could do the SAP thing, but can I do, you know, this mission critical workload? I mean, I owe it to the world. Then my responsibility is much bigger than the sum of its parts. And the transition this company needs to go through over the forthcoming two, three, four, five years, am I capable? And and that was when I called you and said, Tiff, am I going to be able to do this? Do I have the skills? And we broke it down a little bit. And you know, I made the decision, um, even though I lacked a bit of confidence, which is what we're trying to solve, obviously, with inner wings. But I, I made the decision in a leap of faith, in the hopes I'd be able to do it. And you know, you and I say this all the time: pressure makes diamonds. I, I mean, if diamonds were falling from the heaven because I had so much pressure of taking this. You know, investment EQT made in Sousa two and a half billion dollars to turn it into something much more valuable than the two and a half billion it spent in a full on transformation. When we go to market, the brand, how we sell, how we service, everything about the business. So, you know, it was never for me, um, how do I, you know, I want to be a CEO. It was much more of, you know, do I have the faith and confidence in myself that I could drum up to be able to do this really big and important job? And, you know, am I going to be able to take care of the thousands of employees that are going to, depend upon me and and the big global blue chip customers they're going to want my service and my software um, and, I, and I dove in two feet uh, didn't look back I had an incredibly supportive board an incredibly supportive network of colleagues and friends like you and uh, and others and also um, you know EQT as a private equity from they, they didn't even think twice and not only did they not think twice but they, here they appointed right an American British woman to lead a 28 year old German company. You know, and, and I mean, you know, I walk in the door and people are like, oh, gosh, look at you know, what's going to happen here. Um, and, and they didn't even think twice. They didn't doubt me. They didn't have, you know, anything less than full faith in my capabilities. And that definitely was some fire in, in I think, helping drive this company and me personally to success. So I think my advice would be, you know, when you're at a crossroad, right, for anyone, whether you're male, female, young or old, wherever you are in your journey, that when you have a crossroad ahead of you, you know, you're probably so much more capable than what you realize. I, I mean, and we talked about this before. In fact, I've, I keynoted about it um, in, in previous sessions and in, in many places about, you know, don't wait for, you know, a tragedy or a success or something monumental for people to realize exactly what you're capable of. You know, for me, I had a couple of situations in my life where I was forced into understanding my capabilities. This was a good one. Um, and I'm certainly grateful uh, to everyone, EQT, 
um, you know, our chairman, Jonas Person, who's believed in me from day one, um, my cheerleader, um, and, and all of the employees of SUSE who felt that they were in good hands with me. Um, you know, and here we are 20 months later, a public company in Germany, which I'm super proud of. Well, not only well, not only a public company, right? But the uh, I think the largest software company to go public in Europe this year, one. Two, uh, the first time a woman has led a IPO in Germany for a billion dollar company. So congratulations to you, right? Thank you. Thank you. you know, uh, I, I, but you know, it's interesting is, is that I often hear, right? Women tend to have that imposter syndrome. They sort of say, can I do it, right? I don't have the capabilities where a man's like, I'm just gonna go for it. What's the worst thing gonna happen, right? And so I think that there's a lot there in, um, and I say this often, the power of the network that you build around yourself, you know, when you ha are at this crossroads, right? You immediately pick up the phone and call your network. Like, let's walk through this. Let's talk about it. Like what, you know, good and bad. And the network is mixed. It's not just all women. It's not just all men. It's just, it's, it's just a network. Um, and I think that that's an important lesson that if you, you know, surround yourself with people who believe in like, I know you're a warrior. I knew you could do it. You know, I knew that you were going to be amazing. Did I think that you were going to be this amazing? Like, I'm so thrilled, right? And, and I, think <laughs> just, I think it's awesome. Um, you. But you, you've put together some really aggressive goals, you know, so you show up as a CEO. Look, I'm going to rip apart, go to market models. Like, what's our brand stand for? What's the organizational structure? We're going to put in people. Um, there was a lot of change happening really quickly. You know, I, I went and, and had the honor of speaking at your offsite in uh, Barcelona. Um, yeah. I guess it's been two years now, right? Two years Last ago? Year and a half, yeah, I got in November will be two years ago. It's hard to believe, yes. Yes, um, and so how do you sort of manage and lead? You've got people listening who are not CEOs of billion dollar brands, but you know they might lead a team that is now remote, right, virtual. And, and how do you lay out plans and get people aligned, right, and get them inspired um, during this time when you cannot be face to face. It's it's real. I mean, this is the hardest job ever. I mean, you know, in my first 100 days as CEO, I said I would visit every major office. I would try and visit 100 customers in 100 days and meet at least half of our employee base. Um, I didn't make 100 customers. I made 97. I, I met 1,223 or 50, 1,253 uh, employees. I visited every major office. And, and, you know, at the end of the, that 100 days, I thought, gosh, I'm really tired. It's nothing compared to what we're doing now. Like sitting here and, and, and bringing, you know, Europe's largest enterprise software IPO this year, um, it, it was much harder doing it virtually. So how do you connect with people? Um, you know, when you meet people face to face, it's a lot easier to read one. You know, you can kind of you can kind of see when someone's, you know, full of malarkey and full of smoke and you can kind of read through it when you're face to face. But over over video, it's so much harder to connect with people. During the, big, the early part of the pandemic, I did every Monday a video call very similar to this to all of our employees. This is what's on my mind. This is what I'm thinking. Um, I, I, and I just remained completely and utterly open. And, you know, I, I chose to be open. I mean, even to the point of being vulnerable as a person. Um, my mom had COVID early on. She wasn't very well. I, you know, we talked about that to the employees. I talked about my personal experience, my hardships. What I was, I was having a hard time because the kids were at home and, the, and my daughter was homeschooling. And you know, the, the way to really connect with people is to genuinely be authentic. And you can't, you can't make that up, right? And 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 yes, it takes more time to do it online. But being available to our employees, um, you know, being open. I chose open, and I, and I still every day. Um, choose open. In fact, um, I've written an open letter to the world, which will be published over the next three weeks. And The Economist is going to be in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, all the major newspapers across Germany and the UK and in the US. And, and it's all about being open. It's not just about you know being open for Susan, but it's about, about being open for mankind. Uh, the only way that we will move forward and progress is to be open to the people around us, be open to different ideas, and it really lived the principle of allowing yourself as well. Don't ask people to be open with you. You have to prove that you're open to them. And, you know, I, I did lots and lots of calls. I, I, I used to divide my time a third, a third, a third, a third with customers, uh, you know, a third with, with internal and a third with the press. Um, during COVID, it was 65 to 70% internal and then the 30% online with customers. And it kind of bagged a lot of other things because I needed to focus on the well-being of my employees. And you know, the thing we did, we put first their emotional and mental well-being. 
And, and we had to prove it. We instituted programs and investments and people and, you know, in, in, in the flexibility that they needed to be able to flourish in a time when we didn't know how to help folks. You kind of changed it, wrote the script every single day. Um, you know, same thing with the IPO. I'm doing an IPO virtually, sitting at this desk for 13 hours a day, over 120 investor meetings over 10 days. I, you know, by day three, I was like, how am I, how am I going to do this for seven more days? But you know, somehow allowing yourself to be open and vulnerable and, you know, allowing open feedback has gotten us through. And I think, you know, ultimately the flexibility we awarded our employees, um, you know, created a sense of loyalty and a camaraderie with one another that, you know, perhaps we wouldn't have otherwise had. It's not been an easy. And, and, and as a first time CEO, right, I'm, I'm kind of navigating new borders and doing it online. So it was, it was, it, it's not been fun, but the, the, you know, the rewards at the end have been great. So. Um, well, I think the fact that you are a first time CEO worked in your benefit and worked in your favor, right? I mean, there's so much to be said for old habits and doing things the way you always have done it. Right. And then you'd have to change. And that's almost harder than saying, look, I don't know how we, you know, and nobody had a roadmap during COVID of how to, you know, lead and manage and grow and take care of your people. I mean, there was no roadmap. And the first time sort of globally, everything happened simultaneously. Usually it's in a region or in a segment or in a sector. And this was, you know, globally, boom, kind of in a 30 day period, everything just went quiet. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, what, what was the two things? Like what was something you didn't expect as being a CEO, what you didn't expect sort of on the IPO, and then what did you expect that happened in the ways that you would have thought it did? Um, so what, what, would, what would I not expect um, about being a CEO? I thought um, the single biggest learning experience for me is it's really lonely. And I'm not saying, oh, poor me. That's not at all. You know me better than that, right? But, yeah. it, but it is, um, you know, you kind of have to, you have to remain open and agnostic and vulnerable, but at the same time, it's a very lonely position to be in because as the CEO, you have responsibility and accountability, taking care of folks, but almost in, in, in a very different way than what I had envisioned. I thought that, you know, I, I would be welcome to be part of a team, but almost you're incubated um, until decisions could be presented to you. And it, it, just, it was weird for me. I mean, I wanna be engaged in the business. I wanna be involved and not because I'm a micromanager at all, because I'm genuinely interested, right? I want to be involved in forecast calls. And I want to be involved in roadmap and engineering. And, you know, but I'm not, and it's certainly not any sort of saying I'm not welcome. And that's not my role. My role is to help lead and to help, you know, nurture the business and grow and inspire rather than be part of the day-to-day -day operational stuff. Um, I need to empower the leaders to make decisions. And that inevitably, that empowerment creates a bit of isolation, you know, for me, I'm not as, as engaged as I thought I'd be able to be, which was a whole new experience for me because I was so used to being hands-on and, and, I, and I needed to be less hands-on and more empowering. And that was something I, I truly didn't appreciate. I didn't expect. Um, you know, what happened in the IPO, I think that um, I, I was unexpected and then what was expected. Um, we were overwhelmed with interest. Um, it was very, very well received. Um, I, that was the hopeful bit. I was hoping that we would be very well received. Um, but there was a lot of interest um, and notoriety, if you will, around the IPO, um, partially because we're, you know, a 28 year old German company, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're profitable and we're fast growing. It's, you know, the, the trifecta of, of, of most tech businesses in Europe just don't have lots of interest from the U.S. more than I, I thought we'd have. So that was quite surprising. But a lot of support for me as a CEO as well. I, I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I didn't know how the German market would accept me. Right? I didn't. I thought, oh, how's this going to go? You know, I'm an American British CEO of a German company running the business remotely out of the UK, listing a company in Germany. Um, you know, how, how am I going to be? I'm not the traditional, you know, model of what a CEO might, you know, maybe physically would look like. I mean, I'm quite loud and opinionated and I've got big goals, right? I'm very, very ambitious. No. Um, you know, and that's not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, <laughs> I thought, how, you know, how is this gonna go? But I'll tell you, um, I was extraordinarily well accepted, accepted in, in Germany. And, 
you know, you know, with with Angela Merkel's recent um, appointments of having you know quotas for boards and, and really trying to push the diversity and inclusion agenda, specifically around female leaders, um, I was incredibly embraced by the country, by business leaders, by entrepreneurs, by you know old um, you know family run businesses. I, you know, I, I get called every day and congratulated every day, and you know, you're an inspiration. And that, I didn't expect to be welcomed so warmly um, by the communities across the German market as I had. And 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 I'm, I'm you know I'm super honored and pleased to say that I was I was very warmly welcomed to not just the German stock exchange but the German community of business leaders, which has been um, fantastic I, for for me, but moreover for women in Germany. Well, I, you know, it, it makes a difference, like you said this. 20 minutes 20 ago, minutes. right? You can't be what you can't see. And, and I think that there's lessons in here for anybody who aspires to be a leader, anybody who aspires to be a CEO. Um, you know, it, it, there is so much to be said for it. You and I have had this conversation over, uh, you know, many a glass of wine at your kitchen table yes. um, on, uh, you know, are you an entrepreneur? Are you an entrepreneur? Are you someone who wants to lead a company? You know, and those are very different paths. You know, I, like I always say, I, I don't know if I could stand up my own company. Would that give me as much joy as working for somebody, you know, and being an entrepreneur in an organization um, or having greater impact? It's much harder to have greater impact as an individual contributor in your own company than, you know, having, uh, you know, the opportunity to do things. So, you know, what does the next, you know, 18, 24 months look like for you as a leader for the company? You know, now you've just come out, I think the IPO is two weeks ago now, like if we're doing yeah. this live, right? So yeah. it was uh, the end of May? 19th of May, yeah. yeah. So what's sort of going forward for you? Because I know you have extremely aggressive growth goals. I would expect nothing less. I think you said double. So, you know, what does the next sort of 18, 24 months look like for you? Yeah, I've got big dreams. Um, as 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 I told the investors when I was pitching the IPO, then don't make your buying decisions based on my dreams. But let me tell you what they are. Um, <laughs> so I am um, I'm I'm fully into Souza. In fact, in the IPO, I reinvested eighty percent of my proceeds um, in the company. So I, I believe in this business. I mean, so much so I put my own money personally back in, uh, which says a lot. You know, it was very well received by our investors by the investor community. Uh, because I believe that th th this business is so much more valuable of what, than what we were listing at. Um, you know, we went out on the, on the worst day of the DAX all year. Um, we priced in the worst week of the NASDAQ all year, which obviously NASDAQ drives tech valuations globally. So, you know, we had some bad luck in way of timing. The IPO was hugely successful, but, you know, my view was um, I got big plans for the business. Um, I've got, you know, really ambitious goals. And um, I'm going to reinvest. So I'm here uh, for the next couple of years, at least. Um, you know, I, I don't see an immediate exit outside of Sousa. I'm, I'm really invested in this business, and um, I, we've got so much opportunity here. Um, so you know, I, I'm all in with Sousa, our employees, our communities, and our customers. But you know, what will happen in five years from now? Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, we have to um, see what mountain needs to be climbed, what problems need to be solved. I suppose. Um, but I've got a lot to do here, right? You know, right now and for the next couple of years, for sure. Well, it's been a pleasure having this conversation with you, right? I could do it all day. There's no question of that. Um, but I think you have uh, shared so much amazing wisdom. So I appreciate you, my friend. I appreciate your time and, and spending it with us. So um, any last parting words of, you know, how people can maybe get a hold of your children's books or, you know, keep in touch with, with what you're doing with Sousa? Yeah, absolutely. I would love to, to tell folks about the children's books. I've got two that are in print right now. You can buy them in the U.S., in the UK and, and anywhere on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, even Target. Um, the first book you, you can see behind me is The Magic Box about a little girl who gets in this box and feels she can be anything and do and, and be anyone. So do anything. So it's it's pretty magical. It's after my daughter Francesca. I've got a video of her jumping out of a you know paper box, a cardboard box. Um, the first book I wrote is is, is coming out of print now. Um, it's it's just the, the printing date has just passed. So it'll be in the market you know very soon. It's called Kick Like a Girl, which is the first. And I think the best one, it's, it's hugely inspirational. In fact, there's a little thank you in there. So when you, when you get it across, you must buy it, Tiff, because there's a, there's a TB thank you in there. Um, and then the, the last book, which actually was the first one out of, you know, from, the, from the publisher, is How to Mermaid's Poo. So you can buy any of them on Amazon, at uh, Target, Barnes & Noble. But you can find more about our charity called Inner Wings at www.innerwings.org. You can find about all the programs, online learnings, and initiatives we have for young girls. And of course, you can keep in touch with Sousa, with Sousa.com and um, keep your eyes peeled, big times ahead.
for Sousa, for me, for the industry, the market. And of course, I can't wait, Tiffany, to have you at our next show, which I hope is going to be in the fall. So thank you very much for having me, um, profiling me, but also more to the point, um, Sousa and the importance of being open. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. My name is Tiffany Bova. Thank you for joining the LinkedIn Live for What's Next. My amazing guest, Melissa DiDonato. So we appreciate you spending time with us and make sure you go out and buy copies of her book and participate in the uh, charity and the organization. So thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.